It's a, a layered approach and I think that's what makes so many people fall in love because you instantly can kind of walk in and see these pieces and say, I identify this be with this because, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's, it's a great way to, to uh, respect a designer's legacy. Hi, I'm Clarissa Esquera. I am the Associate Curator of Costume and Textiles at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the co-curator of Lee Alexander McQueen, Mind Mythos Muse. Hi, I'm Michaela Hansen, Curatorial Assistant of Costume and Textiles at Los Angeles County Museum of Art and co-curator of Lee Alexander McQueen, Mind Mythos Muse. Hello, my name is John Matheson. I'm a writer and archivist and a uh, consultant here on the project with Lee Alexander McQueen, Mind, Mythos, and Muse. Why don't we begin with how this project started, and that was with Regina J. Drucker. So she donated a large collection to us several years ago, and in that donation of high fashion of 20th and 21st century clothing representing many designers, the largest percentage was of works by Alexander McQueen for his eponymous label. And based on that, we realized that in our permanent collection, we had quite a large collection of McQueen, and we should show it to the West Coast, who's not had a exhibition on this really important designer of, of the 20th and 21st centuries. So John, why don't we hear about how you came to your archive because you have such an encyclopedic, vast knowledge of, of this artist. Well, uh, thank you both of you. I mean, it's, it's been an absolute honor. It's kind of the ultimate end result of what I wanted to do in starting my archive and kind of putting together all of these details about McQueen because it is my goal when I set out, when I started following McQueen's work, which was in 1996, I saw my first collection um, on American television. And I thought to myself, who, who is this creator? Who is this designer that's doing such vast storytelling that you know delves into socio-political issues, uh, art history, cinema, uh, pop culture references? It was kind of all there for his playground to kind of dig into and explore. And so when you reached out, I thought, okay, here we have an interesting opportunity where your patron has come forward and said, here is all this, you have the background and the format and the environment to present it in a way that I've always viewed it. So it seemed like such a perfect synergistic pairing to me to be able to then lend all of my resources, the media, the, the references, the video, all the things that we talked about, it was the ultimate yes for me. What would you say that this approach of, of contextualizing McQueen's designs within art history, how is that unique from your point of view as someone who knows so much about this designer? It, to me, is it's a next evolutionary step in viewing his entire career. And I think what's so great about what you've done with the collection here and how you've chosen to present it, pairing it with different types of art and art medium and creations, it continues the dialogue to the next step. So where we've seen exhibitions, we've seen retrospectives, which let's face it, they can't be topped, right? They <laughs> yeah, have their place in history, right? Absolutely. So now we can actually start to create conversations about things and do a bit of push-pull, and some might be a little uncomfortable, some might be, you know, celebratory, and it allows, in a very modern way, for us to view his, view his clothing, which I would like to think he would really appreciate. You know, it continues on. It's, it lives beyond just that moment in time. John, we would love to know more about what are some of your favorite juxtapositions in the display here at LACMA. I'm especially drawn to, and this one's a little bit more subtle, and I think that's why I like it, um, the pairing of the checkerboard suit from Autumn Winter 2003 Scanners collection um, with the Gilbert Adrian suit. You can see distinct similarities here in, in shape and silhouette and cut that would be very easy to uh, reference Lee McQueen going into a museum and looking at something quite historical but bringing it forward and kind of twisting things and tweaking and adjusting and 
I think that's a really cool pairing because, well, first of all, I think tailoring is one of the things yeah. that I'm the most attracted to. Yeah. And um, absolutely a McQueen hallmark. But it's also a lot like the exhibition itself because McQueen surrounded himself with so many incredible creators. And I think it's a bit of an uns unsung skill of his to be able to pull from people whose skill completed his vision. And so to also see that kind of paralleled in the pieces that are kind of put here, you also see maybe the environment that it could have influenced or resources that could have been explored that things could have been pulled from. So there's kind of constantly a dialogue both then and now seeing how things work and speak to each other. Yeah, when we first saw that scanner suit, well, first of all, just the construction of it with the checkerboard, I mean, it blew us curved away seams. and the curved seams. And just to know that that was produced in multiple sizes, how did they do that patterning? <laughs> Absolutely. Blowing yeah. the mind. But then as we got deeper into it, realizing that that checkerboard references to the Tibetan leg of the journey is sort of told on the runway of Scanner's collection. You see the same checkerboard pattern in Tibetan rugs. And that pattern is, is referenced within the pieces in the Scanner's collection. But we did choose, because this is the hard thing, as McQueen was referencing so many things and then when we're curating you have to figure out what thing you want to pull which out story which to story tell. so we could have put the suit in the scanner section but because of the crazy tailoring on it we felt we got to do something with Gilbert Adrian who was a Los Angeles based designer so important to the 20th century and he himself was known for his tailoring I mean he that was his hallmark so I kind of as a costume historian think of McQueen as another Adrian. Who else could replace such a genius as Adrian? And the way that he constructed suits, also with curved seams, also with a pattern that totally matches everywhere, which is also mind-boggling, but McQueen, who did the same thing. Yeah, the shared sensibilities of really two tailors working in women's wear. It's so special. And yeah, where, where have you ever yeah. seen anything like that? One thing that we realized in mounting the show and doing the photography for the exhibition is how he returns, well of course we all know about elongation of the torso and the bumpster, but the spine too. Just the way that the piece from Natural Distinction, Unnatural Selection, where the photo printing is so purposefully placed to look like a spine in the back. And there's other references like that all throughout the show. There is a biological approach to so many things mm -hmm. that, that McQueen did. And it's funny, we talk, you know, we talk about in like fitness about the core being the important <laughs> part of the body, right? It's, it's almost like that's the nucleus of where his work yeah. almost starts. So whether it's the spine, it's the hip line, it's the bust, it's the shoulder, there's this kind of almost like this orbit that happens when you look at his clothes where everything's kind of concentrated there. And so when you take that into consideration, no matter which piece you're looking at here, there's always something that intersects that part of the body somehow. Yeah. And with the dress that we're talking about, we start to see the incorporation of digital technology and digital printing to where crystal and a print of a crystal is arranged to replicate that vertebra that we're talking about, which starts to form ideas that we see later in Plato's Atlantis. And so it's like, it's biology, it's evolution, it's these things evolving with what he does. So it's, it's quite fascinating to see that carried through in every little collection in a different way, the way that core in the anatomy plays a role. Yeah, and I mean, speaking about Plato's Atlantis and evolution of his work and evolution of artwork, one of the great things in really understanding what he was trying to accomplish with that collection and the ideas of people evolving back into an ocean. Speaking with our colleague Rosie Mills about palissy wear, which was just something I'd never heard of. It, it made me feel like the evolution of art, like he's continuing this whole idea. Yeah, absolutely. And in the palissy wear, these ceramics where, you know, artists are doing almost an analog of what McQueen is doing with the digital printing, where they're using clay to take life impressions of animal skins to really capture, you know, true to life anatomy and, you know, the texture of scales on a snake and how McQueen, you know, centuries later is able to use digital technology to capture the same thing. Despite the differences in these materials, they're both examining sort of the human effect on the natural world and creating these beautiful patterns and vivid colors and, really creating these collaged artworks that are 
directly taken from nature, no matter the technology that's used, you know, to create it. Yeah, he's evolving this idea, this thread, I guess, if you will, <laughs> in artwork from centuries before yeah. into something relevant now, still thinking about nature. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's quite mind-blowing if you think, you know, by the time we get to Plato's Atlantis and McQueen's career, you see everything's kind of taken to the nth degree. <laughs> and what he was doing with technology at that point, of course, printing by then, of I mean, that was ubiquitous with fashion, right? It's not like that was the new, but what was being done with it? What approach was being used to use print mimicking pattern design, which in turn mimicked the shapes that evolved naturally in nature? So Michaela, to your point, is it the fin of a fish or is it the pattern of a, of a snake skin, like you were saying? And the complexity that must have had to have happened in order to get those patterns to line up because when you see those pieces yeah. there's cuts there but the print doesn't break right mm -hmm. it's met perfectly and the fold of the sleeve so this ability to build a garment using a pattern printed on the actual cut of the garment then assembled it's unbelievable the complexity of that and what that must have taken and the thought process to get there There's, there's a few pairings I thought it would be fun to maybe explore a little bit too with, with your expertise. One was the use of the many pieces from the collection Neptune from Spring Summer 2006, as well as I, which was a bit more controversial from Spring Summer 2000, which was shown in New York during a hurricane, of course. And I'll start with Neptune because when you think of kind of classical Grecian and mythological references, you see this kind of brought forward a lot in this collection. I thought that it was quite interesting in how you worked with the museum's collection to pair that with really, really ancient pieces that were reflective of the actual silhouettes and, you know, the kind of column shapes that you see. What was that like to maybe kind of try and decide what pieces you were going to uh, have that be represented by? You know, it's interesting because the idea of, of classical art and antiquity has for centuries been something that fascinated many artists. We actually had a lot to choose from. Yeah. It was amazing. And so we kind of were able to really select specifically with the objects that we had because there was so much. It was, it's, it's such a theme that many people in the past gravitated to for whatever reason. And in McQueen's case, you know, making, situating women as strong warriors or pillars of strength. And so one of the things that was interesting to us as costume historians too is how he was drawing on on actual silhouettes and costumes of antiquity. So pulling the Beaufort painting where you can see the curis bodice and the shorter skirts and cloaks and everything and, and how that can relate to the piecing of the netting of the green dress uh, or the way that it's gathered much like an Ionic Keton or something like that. You could see that in, the, in these paintings. And then we were so excited in looking at the boxer belt with the two confronting seahorses or hippocamps. You know, we were able to include a hippocamp from antiquity, but then also just it, because it's such a reoccurring interest to artists, examples from also the Renaissance. So, and one with a turbano shell, how that came to Germany to be made. I mean, it, it's amazing and how these ideas have captured people of Neptune, of the sea of seduction, of death and all of that, how it continues to capture artists today like McQueen. And for me, it's quite fascinating because that collection, upon review, some people might see not as probably one of his more prominent or strongest <laughs> ones, but when you see it in an environment like this, you certainly get a different perspective of it and you have a whole different respect for the construction and what it took for the jersey to fall the certain way that it did, like you said, in reference to something much more classical and ancient. I think that was a great decision in that while there might have been this kind of, because there was a bit of a rock and roll reference with that uh, collection as well, you know, yeah. you get Tina Turner in the background and Missy Elliott, like, <laughs> you know, nothing was ever as it seemed on the surface with McQueen, so you kind of get a bit of mix in there. But then, you know, pulled forward in this environment, it elevates it to a different level. Yeah, and I mean, to add to that, just even the idea of a columnar dress silhouette, which of course is a reference to classical column architecture, which of course, was something that inspired our architect, Michael Maltzen architecture. And you can see in the beautiful colonnades that they constructed for the display. And it's this kind of idea of 
you know, in Western fashion and Western architecture, these classical foundations that artists and architects return to again and again because, you know, they're so inspiring. You know, we're so lucky we could meet with the curatorial staff in our Art of the Middle East department to really make sure we're telling a holistic story, that we look at both sides. And so we have beautiful textiles that are created in Turkey and they sort of relate to the, the woven pattern on McQueen's teeny tiny mini skirt from the eye collection on display, <laughs> but that demonstrate how these Turkish textiles were exported and adapted for Orthodox Christian use. And this dialogue goes both ways. It's not only Western artists borrowing from Eastern art traditions, but we also have a beautiful Palestinian headdress that we've paired with McQueen's top that has a little belly button cut out and coins adorning it. Um, and you can see how in this Palestinian headdress or a money hat, which would have been worn by a Palestinian bride, um, the coins on it are both inscribed with Arabic script, which McQueen's top is sort of mimicking, although it's not true Arabic script. It's a McQueen written in sort of a decorative calligraphy <laughs> kind of effect, but they're also Habsburg coins. What's amazing about really encyclopedic art is you can see the exchange that happens in any culture in material goods over time. The photograph of Natasha Atlas, I think, was such a fantastic pairing because it is, it's the viewpoint of, you know, the female body taken through something that's much more non-traditional. The artist, Yusuf Nabil, he worked with Natasha Atlas and asked her, and they collaborated yeah. on the view of his camera. So, you know, there's this whole idea of, of revealing, concealing, and, you know, that tension between and what, and what is appropriate for whatever culture that McQueen was investigating. But in Yusuf Nabil's photograph, he asked her to collaborate with him. And that was the viewpoint, and it was totally in her control, mm -hmm. which we thought was beautiful. And also he, as an artist from Egypt too, we, we felt it was really important, and we're really thankful for our colleague, Linda Komarov, who's the head of the Art of the Middle East, who recommended this photograph and wrote a beautiful text on it for the book. Let's talk about why we feel McQueen excites people today. That's a beautiful question, and I always love to talk about it because the endurance of a legacy like Lee Alexander McQueen, it carries so much weight and so much power for so many people because I think so many different people from so many different backgrounds can find something within what he's done that they identify with. And it might just be that that's a really beautiful garment, which is absolutely amazing. But it's also that, and I know this is very important for me, you see someone who kind of didn't fit the, well, not just kind of, he didn't <laughs> fit the mold of a designer. He kind of shouldn't have succeeded, but then you go to the core of what his success was based on, and it was pure talent and skill. And so once you have this, this nucleus of that, and the craft which elevates everything, you bring it up and you start talking about taboo issues, you start pushing the envelope a bit more, you use very widely uh, recognized cultural references. I mean, the, the cinema references alone, people could just fall in love with. And I think that really speaks to many people. You know, if you are somebody from maybe an ostracized background and maybe not feeling connected to society, you can kind of turn inside, channel your talent and skill, make something really incredible, be it provocative or whatever beautiful means to you. And I, I think there's an endurance to that and the emotion that's packed into all of that. You pick up on it in every thread and every shoulder and every pattern. It, it, it doesn't seem to stop. Like there's, there's not an expiration date on that. <laughs>